everyone for joining us today. Uh, good afternoon for those in the UK. Um, I guess good morning to those on the East Coast of America and uh, good evening to those, I, I guess, in Asia. Um, thank you also to those who joined us from California and Australia. Um, to be honest, you can go back to bed. We'll record this for you. It's quite late uh, for you there. Um, anyway, yes, thank you very much for joining us. Some quick housekeeping before we begin. I'd just like to remind everyone that we set up a Slack channel for questions and discussion. The invitation link is available in various places, uh, but is hopefully available on your screens at the moment. Um, if you head over there, we can basically use that uh, as a platform for asking questions. Uh, and more importantly, you can react and correspond to any questions that are particularly of interest um, to, to you personally or that you think should be answered uh, live. If the speakers have time, I'm sure they can answer any other questions and follow ups on Slack um, if you'd like to kind of, as it were, hang around afterwards and chat to them. If anyone needs an attendance certificate for this talk, uh, for this webinar, uh, there will be some details about that at the very end of this, of this of the webinar, so just stick around until the end. Um, also, we are going to be putting a quick survey link. Uh, basically, it just gives us an opportunity to get any feedback and get any uh, ideas about how we can improve this webinar going forwards. So we'd like to say a big thank you to the European Proteomics Association, the British Society of Protein Research, the Young Proteomics Discussion Group Committee, and also, sorry, the, the Young Proteomics Investigators Club and the London Proteomics Discussion Committee uh, for their help and support in setting up this webinar. Thanks also to the London Biological Mass Spectrometry Discussion Group, London Metabolic Network, and the News and Proteomics Research Club for promoting this event. We are also grateful for Imperial College London for providing us with webinar support. And obviously a huge thank you to the speakers for taking the time to talk about their work today. We are pleased to announce our webinar in uh, our next webinar in this series will be on Friday the 15th of May, again at 2 p.m. Uh, British Summer Time. And that'll be featuring Professor Andrea Sins talking about the identification of SARS-CoV-2 viral proteins in gargoyle solutions. Also, uh, Professor Max Crispin on mapping the SARS-CoV-2 spike glycoprotein. Today, we are attempting our first multi-speaker event, as you can hopefully see on the screen. Uh, so please bear with us any, through any short technical issues as we hand over between each speaker. So our first speaker today is Alistair Bullwood, who joins us from NHS Digital to discuss their work helping to respond to the coronavirus outbreak. Alistair has previously worked for BT Health, Life Sciences, BT Advise, and as a principal consultant in the Chief Te Technology Information Office, and as of summer 2019, Alistair joined the NHS Digital in Leeds. And with that, I will hand over to Alistair. Thank you, Harvey. Am I coming through loud and clear? Just to check. That I... sounds great. Yeah. OK, excellent. Um, so just wait for slides. So hi, everyone. Um, uh, said my name's Alistair. Um, I lead on open data for NHS Digital. Um, so I want to talk through a bit about that, what that is, um, and then touch on some of the stuff um, around COVID-19 um, and really looking forward to questions and input really. So without further ado, I will, I'll dive into some slides. So there we go. So open health data in 10 minutes. Um, I'll keep me honest, keep me in 10 minutes. Um, so first of all, what is open data? Um, so open data is data that's available for everyone to access, use, and share. So obviously, a lot of health data is is very sensitive and very private. Um, you know, and you have there's a there's a very strict process around that. So the data access request service, which some of you may be aware of, is how you um, access a lot of data within the NHS. Um, but we also publish aggregate data, right, which is um, published on our website and various other places, um, and that's for um, a wide variety of uses. So it informs data journalism. Um, so all of our data is used in the BBC. It's um, informs um, early stages of academic research, um, also um, in, informs a lot of charities in terms of how they build their campaigns and probably our most prominent user group is it informs policy because it gives broad brush trends across across the nation really. Um, so um, that, that's really what, what open data is um, and with um, Prior to COVID-19, I was leading a project to improve our open data offering. Um, we're now, obviously, the world has changed. We're very much focused on what we can do to support COVID. Um, but um, 
when 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 normality returns, um, depending on what that is, open data is still going to be very important, and we're looking to develop that, not not just for COVID. Um, so that's open data. Um, if people want to know more, Open Data Institute, just type that into Google. Um, was founded in two thousand and eight. Um, you know, um, uh, sort of chaired by um, Tim Bernard Lee and Nigel Shadbolt. Um, there's a whole movement out there about the benefits of making open data to support open open science and innovation in the UK. Um, but I want to talk about just open health data in relation to NHS Digital. Um, so let's go on to the next slide. Sorry, there's a bit of a delay, I think. Um, so just whilst that's loading up, I should say NHS Digital. So we are the national technology partner for, for the NHS um, and we um, manage a lot of the national data sets, um, sort of major programmes for IT and a lot of digital transformation to work very closely with other NHS organisations. But we're we're in what is known as the centre, I guess. Um, so I'm still quite new to the NHS, but that's, that's how we're referred to. Um, so what does open data um, for NHS Digital? Really, we have three aims when we're publishing stuff. Um, we want to improve health and social care, be that through policy um, or um, academic uh, research or data journalism. Um, we want to inform the public debate. So it's very important we get the the, the facts and figures out there so everybody has a single source of truth. Um, and that's obviously massively important at the moment. A lot of my conversations at the moment are around things like the shielded patient list, um, you know, potentially some of the testing data that's coming in, you know, e-referrals, making sure there's a, there's, a, there's a single source of truth that's well defined and understood and in the public domain. Um, and also supporting innovation, developing the UK economy. So um, even though we're pushing data out there, there's an ecosystem system then uses that data um, for various purposes. So, um, you know, um, prescribing um, Ben Goldacre, who some of you may have heard of, um, runs, a, runs a team in Oxford um, and that um, uses open prescribing data to inform prescribing patterns across across England um, and to look for cost savings and potential potential outcomes as well. So there's people building apps and services on top of the open data that we provide. And I think we could provide that data in a lot, in, in, you know, in a much better and more structured way, which, um, which I'll come on to in a minute. Um, so those are sort of the three the three benefits I guess we were aiming for. Fourth one I would say is it means that people don't have to come and ask us for data. It's just there on our website and come and get it. So it's much more efficient for us. And at the moment that's um, you know, that, that that's a real benefit because obviously um, you know, we're very stretched um, responding to various analytical asks. Um, so that's our three aims, um, external ones and then one one internal benefit as well. Um, so sort of come into just into a bit more detail. Um, just let the next slide go. Got a bit of a bit of a delay. Um, so just sort of give a bit of a bit of a, um, an overview of what we publish already. Um, so um, we're probably one of the biggest producers of open data sets that I'm aware of in the UK. We've got 265 statistical reports. Um, they range from um, you know, uh, sort of dentistry, hospital episode statistics, aggregate versions of that, um, disease um, registrations in GP practices and under something called QOF, um, to very specific um, data sets, um, for example, for Health Survey for England, which is um, which is a survey that's carried out every couple of years, um, and also stuff around vaccinations, vaccinations and immunisations. Some of our data sets are updated monthly, some are quarterly, and increasingly we're doing daily feeds. So the 111 data, um, it's related to COVID-19, for example, is now a daily feed and we're pumping that out um, for, for, for a range of analysis across um, across the web. Um, that breaks down to a load of CSVs. Um, we would like to get a proper data platform um, in place behind that. Um, obviously, that's on hold as we focus on, on other issues. Um, but we've got about, um, yeah, two and a half thousand CSVs on our website and that is growing continually. Um, and I think exploring and understanding that is probably one of the biggest challenges to academics and really keen to get feedback to see how we can do that better. Um, in in terms of reach, um, so um, what often happens, um, I think uh, one one's a really good example of this. A few weeks ago, um, my team we published um, our uh, one 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 as an open data set, um, but specifically where COVID nineteen had been triaged. Um, it was downloaded a couple of hundred times. We had an interactive dashboard, had a couple of thousand hits, um, fairly small numbers in the grand scheme of things. It then gets retweeted. It then gets onto the front page of the BBC and then it, the numbers get very big. So if you think about it, we're often the source. So in September, um, you know, the, the figures we, uh, you know, alone we, we published there probably reached 41 million people. Our media team think, um, you know, through everything from Radio 4, um, 
uh, the Daily Mail, the Guardian, BBC, and Lad Bible for some reason, which we don't fully understand. We've obviously, been retweeting articles with our data in it or, or relinking them. Um, and again, that coming back to the ecosystems and service and apps. And it's very hard, I think, being in the middle, knowing exactly how people are using our data. And I think one of the things I'm really keen to is to build links up so people with specific questions or specific problems can feed that back into me and my team. Um, and then we can use that to make a better offering to, to make data more open um, and accessible with all the appropriate controls around it. Um, so that's that's just a bit of context, a very high level. Um, so just in terms of something we've been doing specifically around COVID and some of our plans around that. Um, so um, this is online, um, the links there, um, you know, uh, this is, uh, you know, our 111 data, it's pumped published daily um, this is going to be part of a series that we're going to roll out hopefully over the over the coming weeks um, so what we can see here is you can play over time 111 calls coming in that have been um, triaged as suspected COVID obviously because you are not tested on the phone um, or, or, or on the internet um, and you can see that trends and the peaks and troughs and you know you can see London light up and the West Midlands light up over time um, and then we're looking at building this dashboard out linking it to other open data sets so we're looking at things like deprivation, booking, um, you know a range of things, testing, deaths, all the rest of it um, and that's sort of um, you know quite exciting and this is obviously going to be used internally for informing stuff but then we're trying to get um, open versions out there. Um, in terms of stuff that we want to publish in the future you know I think it's in the public domain now that we want to um, you know publish um, you know um, an aggregate anonymous version of the shielded patient list which is vulnerable patients and look at how they um, they, they, they um, fit around the country so we know this is useful for people planning vaccine rollouts um, or other bits of research because obviously vulnerable people are not not all in the same place and spread evenly um, so again when that's released um, which, which is hopefully soon um, we'll get we'll get some feedback and again more than happy if people want to ping me comments on LinkedIn or whatever drop me an email um, that's um, that's 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 really useful um, and then in terms of getting the data which I guess is um, rather important so um, I don't want to overrun so I'll just touch on that very quickly um, so um, you can get the data, I guess there's three main routes. There are many out there. There's our website, um, which um, you can search for data sets and publications. It's not immediately obvious what you're looking for. So it's been built um, the data search more for statisticians and policy folk. So if you're new to the NHS, it can be a bit confusing, but there are other ways through. Um, there's Google data set search. So um, I won't bore people with technical uh, things, but we've been uplifting our metadata. That means um, the Google data set search service, which came out of beta um, two months ago, um, means that all of our data is indexed on there. So think of about it's trying to be like the internet for data really so you can search for, for key terms and data sets there and it can bring it up and it'll link through our, to our website um, and then HDR UK um, so Health Data Research UK um, I'm sure many of you are aware of it um, they have uh, sponsored a portal um, bringing data together for research purposes clinical trials etc a lot of our data is republished onto there as well and we work very closely behind the scenes with them in terms of um, managing that data that metadata and making it explainable um, so that's it really so that's that sort of 10 minute overview of, of, of sort of what we're doing in, in, in open data um, um, in NHS digital and um, a little bit on what we hope to do in, in COVID-19. Um, if you'd like to find out more, um, uh, then um, please get in touch. I've got a contact slide here, so um, feel free to drop me an email, um, uh, contact me on LinkedIn, um, whatever really suits um, and how to take feedback um, and any specific questions as well and if I can direct that to the appropriate places as well um, both good and bad because because we know we don't always make our data easier to use or easy to understand um, and that's something we are trying to fix one of the projects we're looking at is building a, a community hub for people analyzing our open data sets so we can share best practice and, and knowledge um, um, and again that's slightly on pause because of COVID-19 but we're still progressing when we can really um, so that's it open health data in 10 minutes about 12 I think but um shall I hand over back to um uh yourself Harvey shall I uh yeah that's great thanks Alistair yeah. no worries uh yes okay so with regards to any questions coming forwards um we've got a short obviously a short delay uh for this coming through um so we'll just need to wait a moment for anyone who's actually wanting to ask any questions to actually see that okay um but again, uh, please make use of the Slack channel. Um, I think if we can advance the slides forward once more, that should show again the information. But in case it doesn't, it's uh, bit.ly, so it's B-I-T dot L-Y, and that's slash L-P-D-G 
Slack. And it's LPDG. There it is, yeah. <laughs> and it was case sensitive. So, so yeah, please come along and, and join us in that chat to ask any questions and let us know if there's anything you want to get any information on. We're also using that Slack channel for any other resources, um, which will try and keep uh, up to date with any key manuscripts that come out. Um, I think there was a question on the Slack channel briefly about um, open data sets of COVID-19. So there are a couple of links there to manuscripts, such as in fact, the, the, the data that Christian originally talked about. Um, all of his data was made generally publicly available. OK, I haven't seen any questions come through. Um, I'm not sure if that's an issue at my end or if it's a delay on. OK, we, we've got one that's come through from Harry. Uh, how are you handling the data from the mobile tracking app? Um, so the mobile tracking app isn't with NHS Digital at the moment, um, so that's being managed by another bit of the NHS, NHS X. Um, so I can't really comment on that if I'm if I'm honest. And obviously that's still in being designed as far as I'm aware. Um, so. Um, It'll be interesting to see how that develops and whether there'll be an open data set, but I, I really don't know if I'm really honest. Uh, Did you envisage that being kind of integrated with your current data? Um, I, I I don't know. So if, so if um, it's deemed in the public interest to, you know, to publish that as an open data set, then, um, you know, I guess that, that will happen. And then we'd want to do that in a way that, um, you know, could be could be integrated, but obviously there's a lot of privacy and sensitivity concerns there, um, and we need to make sure we address those. Um, so that that that's sort of the big question. Because I think you know, confidentiality and sort of patient safety is paramount. Um, so you know, all those issues would have to be sorted. And I, I'm not close to exactly how the app would work and what what design principles are, but where it's being tested, obviously. But. Uh, see how that develops but i think you know wider point is is is, is covid19 is presenting lots of opportunities for new open data sets that um, i think will build a bit of a public record of how um you know how how you know how covid19 has affected england so you know for example seeing where the vulnerable people are you know how does that link to deprivation you know um when testing starts flowing through a, a large scale which you know it's kind of starting to do already you know all of those open data sets start to build a richer pe picture not maybe just for scientific research but also social research we can start to see what's what's actually happening in in the country um fantastic no really exciting stuff Look forward to seeing where it all goes. OK, so we haven't had any other questions come through. So for now, we'll uh, we'll pass over to Dr. Ben Osborne. Os Osborne, sorry. Uh, ben received his PhD in biology from Virginia Tech, uh, did two short postdocs at the JHU and NCI before taking a star scientist position at the NIAID. His current role is chief scientist at Proteum Proteomics and genomic sciences. He is possibly uh, more widely known for his news and proteomics research blog. And to anyone who hasn't come across it, I would personally highly recommend it. Um, it gives a great overview of current up-to-date stuff that's happening in proteomics um, and is often uh, reasonably entertaining. Um, and is especially good if you like your proteomics updates uh, alongside a helping of GIFs, memes, and uh, very nice little pictures of pugs. So, I will hand over to you, Ben. Great, yeah, well, uh, guys, thanks for having me. How's the sound? Everything okay? Yeah, that's coming through great. Great, great, okay. So let's make sure we can, I can scroll forward here and click and then, whoop, work set is designed. Okay, so uh, yeah, well, everybody, th uh, thanks for coming. It looks like there's yeah, a big, uh, yeah, showing for this, but uh, uh, there's a really long title here, and this is the the initial title of our uh, of uh, one of two preprints that uh, we we've produced. Um, really, uh, what I wanted to uh, I think a better a, be a better summary of this is uh, still getting. Where's the movement? Did I lose it? Okay. Right. So, so I think this is a better title, but this isn't really the the title you want to use. And and but uh, uh, we really tried to roll back expectations in the title. Like we're 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 trying to help other people who uh, might be trying to use mass spectrometry to investigate 
COVID-19 samples. Uh, you know, a, uh, we don't have samples. We're doing the best we can. Here's some tools that we think might be useful. And and really, that's what the uh, the two preprints have done. And uh, um, yeah, and, and that's what we'll, we'll go into here. And hmm, I may have to come and go. All right, so it's a little sly, uh, a little slow here, but um, so. Uh, hmm. Sorry, guys, I'm having uh, quite a lag. Beep. Sorry, Ben, just try clicking on the screen and then. Yeah. yeah. Boop. Click. Click. So I always start with acknowledge acknowledgments first. Um, so Connor is the guy I work with all the time. Uh, ben Neely uh, will, uh, is uh, thrown in on the second draft and has really helped us out here. Um, I'll talk about what Namanji uh, Namanji has thrown in here and helping us develop this into a real idea, um, as well as, uh, um, whoo, come on, go. Hmm. Uh, Animations are poor choice. Uh, so, and uh, Sierra Miller is now helping us with this project, and she's a scary young Byron Prometician uh, uh, um, on this team now. Uh, I'm going to shout out John Wilson here just because he is just a great person to bounce ideas off about anything at any time. Um, and uh, just recently, uh, the Susan Abitiello uh, started helping us with uh, this project and, and working toward validation, which um, I can't uh, show anything of that yet here. And uh, as, as normal for a talk from me, I would like to thank no funding agencies whatsoever. Um, and, and I think a really important thing here, and, and really I was trying to find inspiration for this talk with, with still um, no real data to show, is the, this, this, this idea of the law of the instrument. And you know, Wikipedia describes it like this, and, and it's been, you know, it's been uh, credited to everyone from Mark Twain to Abraham Maslow. And the idea is, is this whole thing, right? That if you, if you only have a hammer, you know, every, everything, every problem looks like a nail, right? And, and, and I really think about this all the time because, um, uh, it, you know, going into the, the second half of my life, uh, I have to face facts that I have two skills. Uh, I'm really good at hacky sack and I can run a mass spectrometer. And outside of that, I just, I just don't have any other skills. So, uh, yeah, I did two postdocs trying to diversify myself and really I've got this one, right? And so, um, but fortunately, I mean, if you're going to luck out with uh, <laughs> with with one scientific capability, you know, you're there are worse hammers to have than mass spectrometry, because really, it is have tried to learn other techniques and you know, a whole postdoc with transcriptomics. Um, I've always been disappointed with everything else because our hammer, <laughs> mass spectrometry, you know, measures a fundamental physical property of matter at, at the atomic mass level, right? And, you know, and right now we're, we're limited by things like quantum mechanics and relativistic limits. And, you know, a lot of times I would say in the past, I would have said, you know, we're also limited by ionization potential. But last year I spent a lot of time converting uh, uranium to gas. And so I'm a little less intimidated by ionization potential because realistically, you put enough energy behind it, you can ionize absolutely anything, right? Um, and, and every other technique out there is it essentially a function of a measurement of a biological or if you're lucky, a chemical property, right? And, and those are realistically functions of basic physical properties, right? So um, when we start to think about, you know, <laughs> oh, can transcriptomics do this? Can we do this with this sequencing technology versus do this with a mass spectrometer? And you're looking at it at the end, every one of these, you're putting a probe against a large biomolecule, which you could essentially reduce down and measure every every single atom within that within that biomolecule if you tried hard enough. So, um, yeah, <laughs> I think that uh, you know the inspiration for this talk is that uh, you know uh, mass spectrometry has a lot of capabilities here, and and uh, but if we apply this to to this. Uh, dangerous virus and uh, wrong one um, to, to this virus, um, you know, going into into a problem as a mass spectrometrist where I don't know what this thing is or 
anything about its characteristics other than there's some RNA here and there's some protein and there's some other molecules, right? And um, while I don't know anything about viruses, I, I do know a lot about the history of mass spectrometry. And I do remember <laughs> that in 2003, when the SARS-CoV uh, epidemic came around, there were lots and lots of studies where people were using LCMS to either study the virus or to attempt to make diagnostics for it. And uh, when, we, when we look at the history of, of mass spectrometry and uh, viral diagnostics, excuse me, the, um, I love this quote from this review, and there's lots and lots of other reasons and things, uh, to, and, and lots of other history to look at, but uh, I'm gonna go and read this. Um, so the application of pathogen detection was particularly successful but the mere use of MS as a, as a detection system in place of gel for electrophoresis did not resonate, right? But mainly because of the seeming complexity of the MS. It wasn't that it didn't work. It, it worked really, really well. The problem was that, you know, mass spec seems hard, right? And so, um, you know, and I think that's, that all comes down to what is your hammer, right? So if you're much more comfortable with, you know, uh, with these, techniques like RT-PCR, which kind of emerged at the same time. Um, and as someone who was doing both at the same time uh, around this this point in history, RT-PCR was kind of crappy. Uh, I know it's improved a lot recently, but um, it, they were they were machines about mass spec sized and they weren't really very good, but it still it seemed easier for, for, for the molecular biologists to go ahead and stick with what they knew. Um, yeah, and you can argue this one out. So. I would argue that MS uh, mass spectrometry is only used in diagnostics if there's no other option. And, and I think that's how we've done this historically. And you know, if there is any option to using mass spectrometry in the clinic, you do that regardless of how poor that alternative is. Right. And so um, I'll call out <laughs> um, my uh, one of my old bosses, but uh, you know, it, in, in this uh, in this review, there's cited as saying like, okay, well, you know, as cool as, as uh, LCMS is for proteomics, don't worry, it's going to be replaced by um, protein microarrays. Definitely going to replace it. And uh, yeah, and you know, <laughs> you know, with a decade of close to a decade of history now, we can say, all that hasn't yet happened yet, and hopefully it won't, right? Or or the microarrays for proteins will get much much better because. Um, uh, let's face it, you know, there's lots and lots of protein microarrays out there. They still suck, right? So uh, somebody show me data soon that so I can stop saying that, but but I haven't seen any to convince me that that, uh, that isn't true. And sure, you know, we have plenty of problems, right, for uh, as a field in shotgun proteomics, right? We've got this leisurely pace of sample prep where it was just really easy to put the trypsin on at 5 p.m. and come back the next day and you know, and, and you've got this digestion, right? But is that is that really uh, essential? Like if you had to do it fast, can you do it faster? Absolutely, you can absolutely do it faster than that. We just got in this habit of, well, you know, it took all day to clean this gel. Let's, let's set up the digest and we'll let it wait all day. Um, we have this reliance on um, this archaic um, nano LC stuff that um, we, we got used to because our mass spectrometers were so slow and so insensitive that it made sense to have chromatography that we couldn't reproduce from run to run. And that even with the same columns at another facility with the exact same samples, nobody could reproduce our data because our chromatography is just atrocious and primitive and uh, really silly. And then uh, we've, been, we've been around as a field long enough to have this, uh, people get very set in their ways and, and get used to using, uh, you know, uh, data processing software that hasn't changed much since the 90s. The 90s, and uh, yeah, I love the 90s, but <laughs> but we don't use a lot of software from the 90s uh, unless you're in proteomics, right? So, and it, none of these, these are actually insurmountable things. They're just things that we get away with because we're we're not asked to do 10,000 proteomes, right? We're not asked to complete that in a year. Uh, we've we've got time to to take our time and do 24 fractions and run them at three hours a piece because you know, why not? We've got the time to do it. Um, so if you wanted to actually take the argument and, and, and take the other side and say, okay, well, LCMS wasn't ready in 2003 to really be helpful to the, to the yeah, 2003 SARS-CoV epidemic. And 
you know, if, if that's your argument, you can say the mass spectrometry has, has improved a little since then. And and I really love this chart. I use this uh, all the time from um, the, you know, the study that's now actually getting kind of dated, but um, that, that shows how much proteomics improved. And, you know, from a hardware perspective and from, you know, uh, the, you know, some of the base hardware improvements from the from the Orbitrap physics, but to uh, just more intelligent ways in which to parallelize data and higher efficiency ionization and ion transfer and things. But but we've improved a lot. So if the argument was like, okay, well, we were we couldn't do it in 2003. Oh, we're hundreds of times better now, and we could, you know, I, I would argue that we could uh, assist here with this stuff. So um, if we go back to the virus again. Um, and we go back to some of the history. Some of the early SARS-CoV stuff identified as a diagnostic the nucleocapsid protein being produced in high enough amounts that you could pick it up with uh, really kind of primitive and, and insensitive um, rabbit blood-based immunology assays, right? And um, this year we found you know a very very similar work based on the exact same thing, showing that this worked in this in this virus as well. And that same study showed that. Um, uh, using a immune swab for the nucleocapsid protein that they could diagnose with about 73% accuracy uh, whether someone has um, COVID or not, right? And so the crazy idea that, that we would come in with is, uh, so if there's a protein here and we're really good at detect, uh, detecting proteins, you know, maybe we should use a method that, that can tell a protein presence at or absence uh, with higher than 73% accuracy. Right, and so um, actually, if you do look at some of these uh, these these techniques and how, and how they they develop their detection limits and their accuracy things, uh, this is from the protein ELISA's. Um, so let's, yeah, uh, where they they dilute the protein in PBS, and uh, you know I can I could do a lot better than 20 picograms per bill of a protein if you uh, if you just dilute it in PBS over and over again. But you know that's that's a different argument. Right, and so, um, and and just to continue this, uh, you know, this is the chart. Uh, the next slide, when we hand the slides out, I'll have all the references here. But in general, what I just want to point out here is that that in for peptide drugs in complex matrices, it is it is very common to uh, go across and hit these detection limits of picograms per mil in CSF or plasma, and routinely. <laughs> Quantify these with validated assays, and and to look at these pro these these peptide drugs, you know, in complex matrices, we're we're in this ballpark, and especially when you consider um, the actual detection limits uh, of some of these um, nucleocapsid elizas and things, where we're orders of magnitude more sensitive, and um, you know, uh, so so that's it. But um, now they've done the uh, whole preaching thing. Um, <laughs> I'll jump over to what we, we were trying to do here. So uh, in January, we were, we, were uh, we, we thought this was a bad idea. And, and I was really scared to drop this because uh, one, everything was getting all sorts of attention and it seemed like, you know, we, we had this reliance on, you know, people with uh, skills in virology and, and DNA and RNA stuff and they'd get this sort out, sorted out, right? And and so what, what we had in January when, when we put this together was this is a weekend of work where we were the protein sequence was launched on NCBI on the 25th or something and we ran them through some things over a weekend. Um, uh, we picked out some post-translational modifications and then we took the, the pept, the proteins, digested them with uh, the Encyclopedia and then made ProSit libraries. And, uh, and you know, that really didn't seem like enough for a paper, right? It didn't seem like that was going to be all that helpful. Um, so th but then we had the idea of like, wait, okay, so maybe we just make this uh, a tool and just compile a bunch of resources together for anybody else that wanted to use things. And and, and again, you know, going back to our hammer, um, I know I do one thing and I can, I can run a bunch of different kinds of mass spectrometers. Uh, I'm really rusty with a SIAX, <laughs> but uh, so we set up, uh, we, so we made translation lists and things and, and they weren't perfect, but but we got them out the door and, and we're hoping that people would find them helpful. Right? And so uh, as an aside here, um, uh, ProSit's great. And so on March 24th, I think uh, one of the speakers last week showed that, uh, you know, 
this data from this huge study. I think it just came out in Nature this week. And if you look at their uh, actual real data that they generated from, from nucleic acid peptides versus the prosate, um, it's shockingly accurate. And, and it's just uh, kind of, I'm kind of dumbfounded about how good the fragmentation patterns are and how well it predicts these things, you know, from, from something we had no data on whatsoever. Um, furthermore, mod predict isn't very bad either. And if you haven't used that, that's all housed in a on a server in Indiana. Um, despite the geography, uh, the, the 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 code is really really good. Because um, if you compare this to uh, the um, data that we're going to see next, um, several of the phosphorylation sites that they that they observe um, were also accurately predicted by mod predict. So uh, that's a solid thing. Um, how am I doing on time, Harvey? I wasn't paying attention. Hi, Ben. Yeah, um, pretty much coming up to the end of your talk. Um, oh, good. But, but yeah, uh, if you could wrap up in the next few minutes, that'd be great. Okay, so so uh, so this paper got downloaded a lot, and we got a lot of positive feedback. And so when we thought that we weren't doing something stupid, we might as well, you know, improve on this, and we get looked for help. And and I don't know anything about viruses, but Namanji uh, Bumpus studies. HIV and President Obama handed her uh, an award for her HIV work, and I knew that was a virus. And uh, so, um, so we brought in some help, Ben Neely and, and, and Sierra, um, who could take this in and make this kind of a, a thing. And, and Namanji's idea was that you know we, we need to find peptides that are truly diagnostic, things that wouldn't cross contaminate with vir uh, with other viruses or other bacteria or the human microbiome, so we could find the best possible targets. And you know, with a hypothetical, if you're going to actually make a diagnostic assay, what would you do? And so, um, the the really, I think the clever thing out of this that we did was uh, um, removal of the microbiome background. And I think if you look at the microbiome from a genetic level, um, you you would make the um, incorrect assumption that the, the the majority of the proteins in human saliva are actually bacterial protein because they don't normalize against protein abundance and so uh so what we we did was uh take a, a large saliva data say, set search it against the entire um, known human microbiome all the bacteria and everything and that and that produced a list that went from you know one e6 possible proteins down to um about 41,000 possible proteins we should consider based on their normalization against their abundance. And then we could subtract that from the background and come up with a better list. Um, we re really, really leaned on purple. Um, so if you haven't checked this out, this this just came out a few months ago and it's an amazing piece of software for moving diagnostic, uh, for, for finding diagnostic peptides, because not only does it remove background, based on exact homology, it actually will scramble peptides and will remove them based on scoring metrics that you can set within the software. So um, so peptides that would uh, have the same mass per charge, but but it but would have a very different fragmentation pattern based on how the sequencing is scrambled can be added, uh, could be used or, or thrown out. So um, I've made fun of the name a lot, but that's that, that's purple. And so in the end, uh, you know, going through an elimination, uh, we end up with, you know, depending on how you want your met method to be and make it as strict as possible. And, and Sierra removed uh, the peptides that are coming in from the, you know, at that point, the couple few hundred um, different sequences we had that, that are highly variable where we're seeing mutations and things. Um, so we don't want to make those use those for diagnostics or for uh, for you know creating um, antibodies because they're you know too variable. But but that's kind of you know where we got there. And the next steps were validating, um, and that's why what uh, Sue came in to help us with. And and the big picture here, you know, this is the big dream is um, you know. Could, could we use LCMS as a diagnostic? It's a first line of defense if another viral pathogen comes on. You know, what, while we're waiting for people to roll out prim primers and, and while we're waiting for people to bleed enough rabbits for us to have antibodies. And um, yeah, and, and that's all my talk. Sorry if I ran over. Thanks, guys. Lovely. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, brilliant stuff. So yeah, again, while the questions are sort of live stream, um, do have a first question that's come in. Um, when we study the different mutants of COVID-19 all over the world, how can we make a strategy uh, to analyze this data? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so um, I, you know, I think this is a, a, a you know, it's a it's a moving goalpost right now. As as hundreds and now thousands of, of different sequences are, are rolling in, um, you know. 
our take on it was that uh, it made sense if we were just trying to develop a, a hypothetical diagnostic for this virus to ignore regions that appear to be hotspots for for changes. And um, uh, Sierra lined up just a, a massive number of these these sequences and was able to highlight um, you know, graphically. And we were able to actually demonstrate that was with the proteomic data that's coming out. Um, uh, you know, these regions that we should avoid. Now, as a is a flip side of this. Um, there's there's really really good work out of um, um, Mosley's lab at Duke where they've used the the variable regions in different viruses to actually track the history of the virus and and where it would have come from um, by by selectively looking for those SRMs. So that's something you could do. There's plenty of historic precedents for that. But at this point, we're just trying to avoid them so that we don't end up with false negatives. Yeah. Lovely stuff. Uh, the question in from Leanne. Uh, practically speaking, how long would it take to analyze a patient's sample to get good diagnostics? And as a second part, how do we adapt this workflow to high throughput diagnostics? Um, yeah, that, that's the real the real dream here, right? And so um, if we take the fastest sample prep that that uh, that I know how to do, so if I needed to check myself right now for um, for COVID infection, I would break out an S trap. Um, if I, you know, hustling on one sample, or you know, it wouldn't take me much longer to do, you know, twelve or sixteen, right? But uh, I can get that, I can get that cleaned up and digested in about an hour, right? And um, you know, if we if we take, um, you know, if we're using a, a small number of targets that we've that are highly selective that that aren't cross contaminating with, uh, you know, the micro microbiome and things, I don't see why you couldn't do that in a sub ten minutes. Um, LCMS assay. So if, if I had to um, diagnose whether I had a high concentration of, um, of yeah, of, of SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, peptides in my system, um, I could have that done in an hour and 15 minutes. That would be my, that's my, uh, my estimate. So um, considering that you can scale, there's a lot of robotics that's, that's coming that, that can scale things uh, at a more rapid pace than that. And, and that we've got some faster digestion techniques like fast, uh, what, no, flash, flash, uh, flash, or what, uh, it's called smart now, when Thermo bought it, smart, smart digest, these fast digestion techniques um, that can be scaled. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's unrealistic at all that we could get, um, use LCMS for high, high throughput diagnostics. We just have to drop a lot of our bad behaviors. Fair enough, fair enough, yeah. Okay, um, I think we'll move on. We're a little bit running a little bit behind. Um, thank you ever so much again, Ben. Um, and we'll now go over to uh, Dr. David Matthews. Uh, David completed his PhD at the University of St Andrews and later moved to Bristol to become a region of virology. He is primarily interested in host in virus host and interactions with an emphasis on respiratory viruses, in particular adenoviruses, but also coronaviruses. Respir also as well as respiratory syncytial virus, influenza and hendroviruses as well. He has been looking at how these viruses interact with the host cell using state-of-the-art techniques including laser confocal microscopy, high throughput quantitative mass spectrometry and deep sequencing of virus infected cells. Over to you David. I think you might be muted, David. There yeah, you go. Sorry, I was clicking the wrong part of the screen. Lovely. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me. I'll um, I'll get straight on with our talk then. So uh, the technique we use uh, is uh, proteomics informed by transcriptomics. It's a technique we've uh, been using for nearly 10 years now. Uh, and hopefully, as you'll see, it uh, enables you to capture an awful lot of information very quickly um, without really needing to know anything in advance. So, this is going to go. yeah, there we go. So, lots of people have lots of different ideas about integrated omics. So, I thought I'd start out by saying what we mean by integrated omics. Uh, so, we're very, very interested in the idea of overlaying lots of different uh, high throughput techniques together. So, many teams uh, in the past and currently still use microarrays or deep sequencing or quantitative proteomics or phosphoproteomics or immune precipitation proteomics. But we think that the very best way of looking at a system is to combine them all 
uh, do as many different types of high throughput systems as you can and then start to overlay them and then what you tend to find is that uh, when you overlay data sets combining pull downs and fossil proteomics and transcriptomics and quantitative proteomics is that uh, hopefully one or two very interesting targets keep coming up in all these different approaches and we started this uh, as i said some time ago uh, in 2012 uh, by looking at illumina based rna sequencing uh, gene expression analysis and quantitative proteomics uh, in an approach we called PIT or proteomics informed by transcriptomics uh, and we showed at the time that this type of approach can be used to infer accurate protein lists from transcriptomic data okay so that is a transcriptome driven proteogenomics type approach what effectively we showed was was that you can take illumina based short reads and convert them back into full length messenger RNA from which you can infer a protein list which when you search it uh, gives you answers very, very much like you would have expected if you downloaded a Uniprot list of proteins to begin uh, to begin with to do your mass spectrometry analysis. So how did we start then? What did we start off with first? So we use this Illumina based uh, RNA sequ deep sequencing, RNA sec, where you sequence uh, messenger RNA first by fragmenting it into short fragments and then sequencing the short fragments and then trying to build things backwards. Uh, and we used at the time silac based uh, quantitative proteomics to look at adenovirus and we did that because actually adenovirus has been done to death by lots of different people and lots of different systems so we knew what we should be looking for when we finished uh, and the interesting step we uh, was sort of like um, was sort of like a light bulb moment was we used this software called trinity which can take very short reads of sequence data and then reassemble them back into full length messenger rna uh, a bit like getting a pile of shredded paper and turning it back into the original uh, instructions. From that, we can infer a list of proteins and then we can search that list of proteins using standard uh, uh, techniques in mass spectrometry, I'm sure you're all familiar with. Uh, and then we can figure out which one of our transcripts are generating the ORFs. Uh, and then we correctly identified all the human proteins that were you, should, you would expect to find from deep sequencing human cells infected with adenovirus. Um, but also what we did find was we uh, found evidence using this approach for an adenovirus protein, which those of us in the field did know existed, but wasn't actually present on any official protein lists. And it illustrated a really neat point about this technique, which is that it is an unbiased discovery of proteins that could possibly be in your sample. So you don't actually really need to know what was in the sample at the beginning. If you have a combined transcriptome and proteome from samples, then you can infer your proteins uh, in an unbiased manner and discover what is actually being made rather than what should officially be made. Um, and that's uh, where we were then. And then more recently, of course, in uh, the world of deep sequencing, a brand new technology has taken over now uh, called nanopore direct RNA sequencing. So instead of taking your RNA and fragmenting it and then sequence the fragments, uh, what you can do is read full length messenger RNA now using this technology. You can see the uh, nanopore operating here. The molecule goes in through the pore. Uh, and as the RNA molecule goes through the pore, you get this kind of squiggly change in electrical conductivity. And then that can be inferred back uh, into a nucleotide sequence. Uh, unfortunately, it is quite error prone. Uh, about one in 10 nucleotides are either missing or wrong. Uh, but you can work around that problem using uh, various bioinformatic techniques that we've uh, been working on and uh, also the inferred proteomes that you get back from trying to infer uh, lists of proteins from messenger RNA, uh, some of which may not be completely sequenced properly. Uh, the inferred proteomes can be very large and can confound your traditional search strategies. Uh, but again, we've developed methods to circumvent this, which I won't talk about here, uh, but we have been able to achieve uh, effective parity with the Uniprot proteome lists. Um, we were actually in the business of trying to get this published when COVID hit, so that work has just kind of stopped dead in its tracks. We were uh, in the middle of a row with some referees, but we had to give that up, unfortunately. So hopefully we'll get back to that at some point. So we used this technique to re-examine our old friend adenovirus. Um, and developed a new pipeline that uh, helps us to characterize the ORFs and, and helps us manage the data sets. Uh, and then at the same time, we were using this then on the uh, rather nastier related cousin to SARS-2. Uh, we were working on MERS, which is Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus, which is present in uh, the Middle East, uh, predominantly Saudi Arabia, unfortunately, uh, and is lethal in about a third of uh, cases. 
Uh, but fortunately, it doesn't seem to spread very well from person to person. So it is not um, really uh, become a global health problem the way that SARS-CoV-2 has become. So we were already working with MERS at the time in our high containment facility here at Bristol. Uh, and so when SARS-CoV-2 arrived, uh, we immediately flipped over uh, and effectively just repeated an awful lot of work we'd already done on MERS and then started to repeat it on SARS-CoV-2. So this is a, a diagram of the virus's genome then. Uh, it's uh, 30,000 nucleotides roughly long, just under. Uh, if you translate, the, the virus uh, delivers this as a messenger RNA effectively inside the particle. So inside the virus particle is a single piece of RNA. It's a positive sense, so it can be translated straight away. There is even a poly A tail on the end of it. Uh, and what happens is, is the ribosome binds here and starts translating. And in um, some cases, you get a the ribosome hits a stop codon, and you just get this protein here called orf one a And in some cases, there is a ribosomal frame shift here, and you get a much longer protein called the orf one ab You end up with polyprotein 1A and polyprotein 1AB. And these proteins then self-cleave basically down into these shorter fragments known as NSPs 1 to 16. Uh, at the same time, what the virus can do is basically uh, fold up its genome and then start transcribing here and jump uh, from one of these positions near the beginnings of these open reading frames over to the leader sequence and in effect run off short messenger RNAs like this where you have uh, each open reading frame is put to the front of the uh, new messenger RNA that the virus generates and you express all these different proteins uh, S, 3A, E, M, 6, 7AB, eight and nine, and then these other two uh, proposed proteins, 9A and 9B. And then there is uh, ORF10, uh, which we'll come back to briefly later because uh, that is the subject of some uh, debate whether it actually exists or not. So we infected cells, uh, initially a monkey cell line uh, called Vero E6s with the virus, and we basically uh, extracted all the RNA and sequenced it and used our technique to infer protein lists. And at the same time, we generated a uh, bespoke list of proteins from the official list of uh, SARS-CoV-2 proteins um, and it tailor-made to this virus. So we would be searching for what is officially known as well as what the transcriptomics infers could also exist. So as part of that, we predicted the individual NSP uh, proteins so that we could uh, identify peptides that would only be explained by proper cleavage down from polyprotein 1A into the, uh, the fragments known as NSP1 to 16. Uh, and also we included the predicted uh, cleavage products from the S protein. The S protein or spike is on the surface of the virus particle. It's made as a larger precursor that has to be cleaved into at least, one, at least once into these two halves called S1 and S2. Uh, if that doesn't happen, then the virus is not infectious. Um, so it's quite an important step. So we wanted to look for those events as well. Um, we also uh, was uh, searching for this elusive ORF10, which has been inferred, but never been seen before in any other coronavirus. Uh, I can say now we put no evidence for it proteomically. The transcriptomic evidence is shaky at best, uh, but what we have done recently to uh, effectively try and rule this out permanently is we've synthetically made ORF10 uh, digested it with trypsin and we're about to do some targeted searches. Uh, once we know the mass charge ratio of the trypsin fragments of ORF10, uh, we will be able to go back to our samples and do targeted searches uh, for those peptides to either include or exclude it. So ORF10 is looking um, dubious to say the least uh, and hopefully we'll have more evidence that probably will more or less 99.9% .9 rule it out. So one of the things that came out of the transcriptomics data uh, almost immediately when we started examining it was uh, this region here in the messenger RNA that codes for the spike protein. Uh, this is the depth of coverage of sequence reads and as you can see there's a dramatic drop uh, in this region here which would uh, remove a handful of uh, amino acids uh, from the spike glycoprotein coding region. And of course, there is still quite a few uh, full length messenger RNAs still being made as evidenced by the depth of read here. So what we realized straight away is that inside our cell culture, uh, the virus had uh, effectively deleted a part of its genome and we now had two viruses coexisting together uh, in viral cell lines. And this is a phenomenon now that's been confirmed by several other groups. 
uh, subsequent to our, our putting our paper out on BioArchive. Uh, and also, um, since that paper came out, we've had reports from several groups that uh, this kind of deletion here uh, also exists in clinical samples. So it exists in the wild, in, in people, uh, and we're actively investigating why that is the case. Uh, if you line up the sequences of uh, SARS virus, various different SARS-CoV uh, sequences, uh, this is the original SARS-CoV-1, uh, this is SARS-CoV-2, where you've got this little uh, uh, arginine-rich sequence, a furin-like cubic site here, uh, and this is the sequence that would be inferred by our deletion. Uh, we started looking for evidence proteomically that this existed, and uh, we realized uh, very early on that what we would need to do is a kind of trypsin digest rather than a trypsin digest because tryptic digest wouldn't release any fragments that you could detect readily. Uh, so we used a kind of trypsin digest and eventually after a bit of uh, hard searching together with colleagues from Queen Mary University uh, in London, uh, we found evidence for peptide spectral matches that uh, cover this area. Uh, and we were able then to do subsequent targeted searches to confirm the existence of this. So we were able to confirm transcriptomically and proteomically uh, that this uh, purin deletion version of the virus uh, does actually exist uh, and is made by the virus and is present in our samples. Uh, and that's really quite important because it is believed that acquisition of this furin cleavage site, as you can see here, may be part of the uh, pathogenicity of this particular virus. Uh, addition of a furin cleavage site makes it easier for the virus to mature uh, its uh, S glycoprotein um, properly uh, and make sure that the, the spike is actually cleaved into S1, S2, uh, and we believe maybe helping it uh, spread to cell types that it might otherwise struggle with. Uh, alongside that, we saw transcriptomically evidence for deletions inside the N protein. And here's an example here again of what the N protein should look like, and then a sequence that was inferred by our transcriptomic data. And again, in the yellow here, we have highlighted uh, a peptide that we were able to positively identify uh, using mass spectrometry, um, that this uh, version of the N protein does exist as well. Uh, the number of reads that support this deletion is actually very small, so only 80 or so sequence reads out of uh, many tens of thousands. Uh, so obviously it's a, a fairly rare deletion. Uh, it's probably down to the virus having a, a, a propensity for recombination and other sort of discontinuous uh, RNA uh, transcription methods that it uses to make its messenger RNA. And we think these probably low level um, mistakes, if you like, although we're a bit uh, dubious to call them mistakes uh, sometimes. Um, but what it illustrates is, is that in the transcriptomic data, you can see these small changes and deletions. Um, but what is absolutely uh, fantastic is to then go off and confirm that inside the proteomics data. And that is the real beauty of using transcriptomics to generate your protein lists. You can really look then at these minor variations, these minor deletions, and check whether or not they are real instead of an artifact of sequencing. So what we are uh, finding then is lots of deletions. Many of them are probably non-functional. Some of them are functional. Uh, and we've seen this in other data sets in other viruses or similar types of events in other viruses, particularly adenovirus, which we published on recently. Uh, and what we can do here is use mass spectrometry to confirm that uh, other transcriptomic type events are real. So the larger question, I guess, is what is the utility to this virus uh, of these uh, deletions? Or, uh, and what are the sort of, you know, what is the point of them, I guess? Uh, so I guess, first of all, lots of RNA that a virus makes uh, fall into category one. They are definitely real proteins that the virus really needs, and you can easily detect them both transcriptomically and proteomically. So those are the sort of traditional ut utility messenger RNA and proteins. Um, sometimes you get minor proteins that are hard to detect by the method, but are functionally relevant. We've got time to get into them, but they, they can also be seen in the data. And then the third category is what this would come into, we think, uh, which is minor transcription proteins that you often can detect. They don't seem to have any direct functional utility, um, but what we suspect the functional use of them is from the virus's perspective is this kind of try it and see uh, transcription protein. So what the virus is effectively doing is, is exploring the potential of its genetic capacity by making uh, random maybe mistakes, if you like, or short deletions or slightly altering the way it makes its messages. These then get made into proteins at very, very low levels. And if by fluke, the virus managed to generate something that is of use to it, then of course there'll be a selection pressure for that 
uh, and the virus will then have a new protein. And we suspect this may be a mechanism by which viruses uh, evolve and generate new proteins is by having this kind of low level background of mistakes in its transcripts and protein production uh, that then may enable it to evolve uh, further. And then finally, just with the last slide, can we get the last slide? Yes. Uh, this is our phosphoproteomics data. So here are the uh, proteins that we uh, examined that we could find phosphopeptide evidence for. Uh, you can see the locations of them there. This is from the paper, so you can have a look at the paper in more detail. So these are locations of phosphorylation sites. As far as we're aware, nobody else has done phosphoproteomics uh, on this virus, though I'm sure there are people out there working on it. Um, what's notable in this data set, though, is that the S protein was phosphorylated, which we've not seen before for this virus type, uh, although it's not unheard of in other viruses. Uh, and we've just completed similar total and phosphoproteome searches in human cells. Uh, and interestingly, we don't see any phosphorylation uh, of the S glycoprotein uh, in the human data. We only see it in the Vero monkey data cell line, and we're trying to understand why that is. It may simply be a problem of abundance because uh, surprisingly, the virus doesn't grow as well in human cells as it does in monkey cells, which is a, an odd feature of this virus. Um, but anyway, so that's my last slide, uh, I guess, and I'll just finish up with uh, thanking the funders, in particular the US Food and Drug Administration, uh, who are funding us at the moment, and the UK BBSRC, who funded us before, and uh, my collaborators who are helping me analyse this data. Fantastic, really lovely stuff. Um, just waiting on some questions to come in. Um, please, again, head over to the Slack. Um, I think. We're also monitoring the question and answer section on Teams. So one question we've got coming through is, what is the benefit of using transcriptomics instead of proteomics? Couldn't proteomics followed up by more in-depth mass spec characterization be more valid? Uh, well, we don't we use one instead of the other. We use both together. Um, the transcriptomics tells you about proteins that uh, are being made that are not on the official lists. That's the beauty of it. Uh, so if you to search as other groups have done, produce proteomics uh, analysis of the virus that they were working with, and all they've done is analyze the official list of proteins uh, that the virus is supposed to make, uh, you would, we would have missed out, for example, on the spike deletion protein completely. You just would not have seen it. Uh, so it's only through a combination of both techniques um, that you see all the detail. Uh, so that's the real power of it. Especially, um, I mean, we've used it quite a lot actually to study viral infections of, of non-human cell lines. So look at viral infections of say insect cells or bat cells and things like that. Uh, and that's where the power really comes through because the uh, official Uniprot lists for non-human um, species is uh, well nowhere near as good as the one for humans as you can imagine. Uh, I've got a question from Harry. Uh, has the deletion been observed in clinical samples? Yes, uh, so uh, and, uh, preliminary data from colleagues uh, here in the UK uh, have found that the uh, spike deletion does seem to be present at low level in a surprising number of clinical samples. So about half maybe, uh, but you really do have to work hard the PCR to detect it, but it does seem to be there. Okay, uh, got a question from, from Ben Orsman. Uh, how long does the nanopore sequencing take? Uh, it takes about two days. Uh, we, get, um, we typically get about 1.8 million individual RNA molecules se sequenced, so it's fast. I've uh, got a question from Lucas Krasny. Uh, did you detect any other potential deletions or just these two? Uh, no, there's quite a few actually. If you go through the paper, there's oh, so there's about a dozen or so different various deletions. Yeah, some of them are premature stops. Some of them are you know weird fusions between bits of the virus's uh, genetic material. Uh, and they are probably, for the most part, ones at a very low level, they're probably just, you know, nonsense, rubbish, just being generated by the virus by accidentally messing up its transcriptomics. Um, but I take you back to the point I made at the end there. I suspect that what this is, is, is the virus trying out its genetic space. You know, if I stitch random bits of my uh, instructions together, 
I might come across something that actually is functionally useful uh, and then that will be acted upon uh, from an evolutionary point of view, wouldn't it? So that's what we suspect is, is the point of these things. Yeah, hopefully not too soon. <laughs> yeah. um, did you uh, use phospho enrichment techniques to identify your phosphorylation sites? Yes, we do. And that's uh, that's handled by Kate Heeson, who's our uh, absolute stellar mass spectrometry uh, person who runs the facility here at Bristol. Um, she is worth her weight in platinum. Um, so she does all that kind of work. So she did the phosphor enrichment uh, prior to uh, the MS stage. OK, do you see value in looking at the virus in other mammalian cell lines? Uh, given that it's now been found in domestic cats and dogs, uh, but that then are not thought to be able to transmit it. Yeah, so we are interested in that. So already, uh, as I said, the, the fossil proteomics suggests that the S is different in Vero monkey cells from human cells. Uh, whether that's a difference between two species or just a difference in two cell lines is difficult to know at this stage. So, uh, and when we worked and have worked previously with uh, viruses like MERS and Hendra, which infect bats and humans. When you look at bat cells and human cells, you can see differences. The real problem is, of course, is that you don't know whether that's a difference because you're just using a different cell line or whether it's because it's a different species. Um, you know, we need to get a lot of different cat cell lines and a lot of different human cell lines, for example, and try them side by side before you get a consistent story, I think. Um, but yeah, I would imagine uh, definitively, if we looked at, um, you know, a, a cat line versus a human line, I imagine over time we'd see lots of differences. OK, uh, have you or, or in fact, will you be exploring any other post translation modifications? Uh, yeah, so this is something that um, we've been talking about with uh, Conrad Besson at uh, Queen Mary, um, the idea of, of looking for other types of PTMs. Um, that certainly in principle is in the data set, isn't it? I mean, the data set is up there for people to download for themselves and analyze if they want. It's on, uh, we put it up on Zenodo, but I think it's now also on Pride. Um, so yeah, people, if people uh, want to have a go themselves, that's fine. Uh, please do. That's why we put it out there. Um, the question for us really is time. Um, as you can imagine, because we're one of the few labs in the UK that actually has a containment facility that actually has the virus, uh, we are somewhat busy to death. <laughs> yeah. So uh, hopefully, this is why we're collaborating with the team at Cornell about the phosphoproteomics, but uh, hopefully other people will have time to analyze the data in more detail than we have time for. Got another question about the phosphoproteomics. Um, do you have an idea how the phosphorylation sites on the S protein can modulate its function? Uh, we don't, but I can imagine all kinds of ways, really. Uh, I mean, classically in virology, uh, usually it's uh, glycosylation and changes in glycosylation that modulate things like uh, the antigenicity. Uh, so, for example, typically in influenza, uh, when the influenza virus changes its um, HA protein, uh, the pattern of glycosylation is changed, notably through N-link glycosylation. Uh, and you can imagine a similar sort of event, yeah, if uh, the spike glycoprotein is phosphorylated or not. So that could have quite a dramatic effect on what antibodies will or will not bind to this virus. Um, so that may be a method. Um, but at this stage, we're still trying to understand why we see none in the human data set. One possibility, uh, as I said, because the virus surprisingly doesn't grow very well in human cell lines. Um, one possibility is that we simply don't have enough uh, so at the moment we're doing a targeted phosphoproteomics search to see if we can see these uh, Vero uh, phosphopeptides in our human data, but just by searching a little bit harder. Okay, and uh, final question. Um, is there any chance of getting information on the glycosylation structures with your methods? Uh, that, I guess, would be a question for somebody who really knows how to study glycosylation in mass spectrometry. Uh, which I don't know. So if anybody knows how that is done, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy them to get in touch with us. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, yeah, I guess that's for somebody who specialises in that kind of work. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you ever so much. Really lovely talk, really lovely work that's coming together there. Um, 